quite a bit older. He was 10 years older than Becky. His name was Nathan Matthews and he didn't live with the family. He would see them on weekends mostly. Um, as I said, he was 10 years older. So, Becky was bullied in high school. At 12 years old, she was diagnosed with anorexia. She was bullied for being fat and so she developed an eating disorder as she just really stopped eating. She was very, very thin and she missed a lot of school as she was unwell. She was also bullied by her stepbrother at home who would also call her fat even when she had anorexia and even when she was very, very thin, unhealthily thin. He would still be calling her fat and he was 10 years older than her. So he was a 22 year old man bullying a 12 year old girl who was also his stepsister. So that is something to note there. By 14, she was physically recovered from her anorexia, but she still was mentally had uh, anxiety uh, amongst other issues from having this eating disorder and from being bullied. At 15, her stepmother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS, and I believe this is a degenerative disorder, so um, if you have it, it just continues to get worse and worse, so it can be very, very hard to live with, to watch happen to someone who is your mother figure in your life. So, um, my neighbours next door have just turned on the TV, and it's a bit loud, so I apologise if you can hear it, but hopefully still sound okay for the rest of this video. So Becky was described as quite a shy and introverted girl. She had a few close friends and she did have a boyfriend as well, but she didn't have a big group of friends. On the 19th of February 2015, Becky went really, really quiet on all her social media and also stopped replying to texts but she hadn't seen her family since two days before that because she had been staying with friends. And when she didn't come home on the 19th, her parents didn't think much of it. They presumed she was just staying at her friends again. Maybe her phone had died. They were trying to think of reasons why she was probably okay. And she was worried, but again, she was just thinking, well, she's probably with her friends. She's a teenager. She's probably just not texting her phone's died or something like that. But the next day, on the 20th of February, Becky's close friends went round to her house to ask if she was there because they hadn't heard from her. Um, this was when Angie realised that no one had seen her for a full day. Angie rang Becky's father, Darren, at work in a panic and he came home. They felt that it would be very out, out of character for Becky to have run away. Um, they looked in her room and they realised that her phone, tablet and laptop were gone, but her clothes were all there and she hadn't seemed to have taken any money, so they thought that was a bit weird. And again, they just didn't think that she would have run away. She was really shy, she hadn't told anyone that she was going to run away. Um, so they thought it was a bit weird and they called the police at 4pm on the 20th of February. She hadn't been seen for 48 hours by this point and it took police two and a half hours to respond and visit the home so they didn't get there till after 6pm. So if you are familiar with um, missing persons cases, the first 24 hours um, of being missing is very, very critical and as the time goes by, the chance of finding the missing person goes down significantly and by this point she'd already not been seen for 48 hours, so it was very, very concerning. Nathan Matthews, her stepbrother, had a girlfriend called Shauna Hall and they actually lived together at a house um, that wasn't too far away, it was just a short drive away and she told police that she believed Becky was in the house the morning before, on the 19th, but she didn't see her, she just heard the door slam. So Sean was in the house with Nathan, apparently, and she said that she'd heard the door slam. Um, a social media campaign was then set up quite quickly. 
with the hashtag find Becky, two and a half million people saw this hashtag. There were hundreds of police officers and volunteers on this case. They mainly focused on searching local houses in the area, as well as woods, lakes and parks, sort of public areas everywhere in the local area. After days, nothing was coming up, so police started questioning Becky's friends and families more and questioning their alibis about where they were on the day that she went missing. Shauna Hall seemed very giggly and light-hearted when she was questioned by the police. Um, her and Nathan's accounts were very, very similar, um, but they were almost too similar to the point where it indicated collusion as their answers were so in sync the police thought they must have discussed their answers and agreed on a storyline so that was immediately suspicious a forensic search was done on the house six days after she was reported missing police believed that she actually never left the house and they did in fact find blood in becky's bedroom along with fingerprints in the blood and these were at three different heights on the wall. Nathan and Shauna were sub subsequently invited back for more questioning. Nathan was asked about his relationship with Becky and he stated, obviously I don't particularly like her and he also called her rude. So this was a big red flag to the police because her stepbrother is now saying that he didn't actually like Becky and also his alibi with his girlfriend is a concern too because they were so so similar. The reason that he said he didn't like Becky was because that he didn't like the way that she spoke to his mother but there were no other reports from members of the family saying that Becky was particularly horrible or rude to Angie. Angie herself did not say this so it's very possible that Nathan was very overprotective of his mother and perhaps a bit jealous um, that he was no longer her only child and obviously Becky was a lot younger. I think when they were little, she was obviously only two years old, she possibly got a lot more of the attention than he did as a 12 year old and he just never really liked her, he obviously bullied her and when this came to light, in the police investigation, it was very, very concerning. So they ran the forensic testing of the blood and results of the forensic testing came back. The fingerprints came back first and these were deemed to be Nathan's fingerprints, but the blood test took a bit longer. So they thought that it still could have been Nathan's fingerprints in his own blood. Perhaps he'd cut himself, gone to the bathroom and got blood on the walls. But when the blood test came back it was revealed to be Becky's blood. So Nathan and Shauna were arrested 10 days after Becky was last seen for kidnap. Police were certain that Shauna was lying in her questioning but they couldn't really find any evidence to directly link her but they just felt that she was lying. Police searched Nathan and Shauna's house and each room was very, very cluttered. I watched some videos of this and it was really weird. It was kind of like a hoarder's house. It was really messy and dirty. It wasn't very clean. When they opened the front door, there was like a fridge freezer directly behind the front door. So the police even found it difficult just getting into the house. Um, and there was no sign of Becky or any of her belongings at the house. So although it was a little weird, they couldn't find anything of Becky's to link Nathan and Shauna to her. Because of all the clutter, it took police a while to realise that there actually was an upstairs bathroom. There was just lots of things in front of it. But they found an upstairs bathroom and they went in and noticed that there was other stuff on the side. But the bathtub was very, very clean. That it was pretty much shiny and this really stood out as the rest of the house was so cluttered but the bath was really really clean. The police then found two receipts to a homeware shop in the UK called B&Q and someone had bought a circular saw, a pair of goggles, um, some gloves and a face mask. 
Um, CCTV was then checked at this B&Q and on the day of Becky's disappearance, Nathan was seen to be buying these items. The investigation then became a murder inquiry. Shauna and Matthew were both arrested for murder. At 10 p.m., Nathan's lawyer read out a statement admitting that Nathan had murdered Becky. I'm going to read out a little bit of the statement now. It was quite long, so I won't be reading it all, and it was also quite graphic. But you can read it online if you are interested in reading the full thing. I, Nathan Charles Matthews, date of birth, 9th of January, 1987, accept that I am responsible for the death of Rebecca Watts. On the 19th of February, 2015, I attended 18 Crown Hill, St George, Bristol, with my girlfriend, Shauna Hall. 18 Crown Hill is where my mother lives with Darren Goldsworthy. Rebecca Watts also lived there. In my car, I had a large pack a stun device, handcuffs, tape and mask. I had developed an idea to scare Rebecca by kidnapping her. I wanted to kidnap her to scare her and teach her a lesson. I believed that she was selfish and her behaviour towards my mother was a risk to her health. Upon entering the property, we all went to the front room. A few minutes after arriving, Shauna said she wanted a cigarette and went into the car. When they were in the garden, I went to the boot of my car and took out a bag which contained the other items. I took everything upstairs to the landing. I think I then took the items out of the bag before knocking on Rebecca's door. She replied, what or hello, and I said, can I see you a minute or similar words. Rebecca then opened the door. I am wearing a mask. I cannot be sure in which order things happened immediately after she came to the door, but I used the items I had to subdue Rebecca. During a short struggle, my mask slipped and Rebecca was able to see my face. That caused me to panic and I strangled her while she was partially in the bag. So that's the end of the written statement. Nathan then went on to admit to taking Rebecca's body back to his house and dismembering her body in the bath before taking her body parts in suitcases to another address and leaving them in a garden shed. He had help from two people, but claimed that they did not know what was inside these packages. Twelve days after Rebecca Watts went missing, her body parts were recovered from a garden shed. Her cause of death was found to be suffocation and many injuries were found to her body. The police investigated Nathan's statement as it did not seem like it was an accidental murder. She was stabbed many times after her death. It also seemed that Nathan was trying to protect Shauna as he said that she had had no part in this, but I find that very hard to believe, especially since she was in the house when this happened and if there were a struggle as Nathan claimed, she surely would have heard some noise coming from upstairs. She also lived with Nathan, so it's just very hard to believe that she didn't know anything that was going on. Nathan was charged with murder after 96 hours of questioning. Police couldn't find any evidence to incriminate Shauna until two months later. They found deleted texts between Nathan and Shauna. They had been through their phones at the beginning of the investigation, but finding deleted messages takes a bit longer, so they didn't find these until two months later. They also found internet searches of pornographic material of young girls, texts speaking about abducting a young female and keeping her in their loft to use as a sex slave. Forensic evidence found on a mask hidden in their house also had Shauna's DNA on it suggesting that she had helped to dismember Becky. There was also some other warning signs earlier in Nathan's life about his behaviour and his obsession with young girls. When he was 19, he brought four 12-year-old girls in his car back to his family home. Darren and Angie would not let these girls in the house and told him to take them back to their homes or take them back to where he had found them. At 21, he got into a relationship with Shauna. 
who Taryn said looked no older than 14. Nathan claimed that she was 19. The family barred Shauna from the house. Angie said, come back to me with a birth certificate and then she can come in the house. A birth certificate or an ID proving that she was legal. They didn't come back until two years later with Shauna's identification, at which time she was 16. So when they'd started dating, she was 14, 15 years old and Nathan was 21. And even then when she was 16, Nathan was 23 and the family were very, very uncomfortable with this relationship as she was so much younger than him and it's, it is inappropriate. Another warning sign prior to Nathan's relationship with Shauna was another ex-girlfriend. He had called the police multiple times as he was stalking her house, playing pranks on her and scaring her. So there were a few warning signs and unfortunately in interviews since Becky's murder, Taryn has said that he wished he acted more on these warning signs to try and keep Becky safe but of course he couldn't have known necessarily that Nathan was going to harm Becky although he was nasty to her and rude to her and bullied her it didn't necessarily indicate that he was going to physically harm her and also many of these comments were made without the presence of his parents of Darren and Andy so they didn't actually know everything that was going on and Becky as a shy introvert girl didn't tell Darren about what was going on she did see a therapist when she was younger and said that she was scared of Nathan the therapist was worried about Becky and told Darren this and Darren tried to speak to her about it um, but he just reassured her that she was okay and that Nathan wasn't going to hurt her um, so it wasn't a very long conversation and he didn't question her further about that and that was sort of the end of that really. The murder trial began on the 6th of October 2015 at Bristol Crown Court. On the 11th of November 2015, after 3 hours and 27 minutes of deliberation, a jury found Matthews guilty of murder and Hall guilty of manslaughter. Both were also convicted of conspiracy to kidnap, perverting the course of justice and preventing the lawful burial of a body and the possession of two stun guns. It was the prosecution's case that what was suffocated in her bedroom during a sexually motivated kidnap plot carried out by Matthews and Hall. According to the prosecution, after the killing, Matthews and Hall put her body into the boots of their car and stayed at the family home for several hours more, during which other family members arrived home. Later that day, they drove back to their own house, where over the next few days, they dismembered Becky's body into eight pieces, including a decapitation using a knife and a circular saw and then Kling filmed her body parts before putting the remains into bags, boxes and suitcases with salt crystals and cat litter. They were then hidden in a neighbour's shed. Matthews admitted to killing Watts but de denied uh, that it was murder. He admitted to manslaughter, telling the court that he tried to kidnap his stepsister as a way of scaring her into changing her behaviour towards his mother. But the plan went wrong and he accidentally killed her. Nathan insisted the killing took place whilst Shauna was in the garden and that she had no part in the murder or the manslaughter. The prosecution claimed that the text messages between the two as well as other content found at their home suggested a shared unnatural interest in attractive teenage females. The prosecution also relied on the CCTV evidence of the movements of Sean and Nathan on the day that Becky was last seen alive. They were seen going into a Tesco supermarket on the 19th of February um, and buying batteries which were allegedly used for the stun guns that they had in their possession. 
footage from the day after Becky was killed also showed Nathan buying the circular saw that he used to dismember her body and between the 20th and the 22nd of February he and Shauna were captured shopping for cleaning products which it was said that they required to clean the bathroom where the dismemberment took place. DNA linked both Matthew Matthews and Hall to the items that were found in the shed along with the remains and an expert was called to give evidence who said it would be easier to carry out the dismemberment if more than one person was involved. So on the 13th of November 2015, Nathan Matthews was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 33 years and Shauna Hall was sentenced to 17 years in prison. In his sentencing remarks, the judge agreed with the prosecution's belief that the planned kidnap was for sexual purpose, telling Matthews that he had a fixation with having sex with petite teenage girls and that he believed Hall had been persuaded to participate in this fixation. He added, finally, I would like to pay tribute to the family of Becky for the dignified way in which they have conducted themselves throughout these proceedings. Hearing the evidence during the trial has been difficult for anyone, but it is plain that it has been an immense burden for the family. Two men, James Ireland and Donovan Demetrius, were cleared of an assisting an offender um, in relation to the moving of these packages of Becky's remains. Demetrius's brother Carl and his girlfriend JD and Parsons, who owned the shed where Becky's remains were stored, had admitted the same charge at an earlier pretrial hearing. Though they insisted that they didn't know what was in the packages, uh, they believed that it was marijuana and they just didn't ask because they were being paid to store these packages. On the 5th of February 2016, Carl was sentenced to two years imprisonment and Parsons was sentenced to 16 months in prison. Matthews and Hall actually both lodged appeals against their convictions and sentences, but in June 2016, these applications were rejected, saying that there was no reasonable argument that the convictions are unsafe or that the sentences were wrong in principle or manifestly excessive. So the two of them are both still in prison. Shauna will be out before she is dead as she was only given 17 years. Matthews was given 33 years minimum but he was given a life sentence so it's possible that he could be in there for the rest of his life. And in an interview Becky's brother Danny claimed that it's not safe for Matthews to ever be let out of prison. It's not safe for other teenage girls and yeah. So this case is very very sad. I remember this happening at the time as it was 2015 so I would have been 15 years old at the time and I remember it in the news and everything and when it came out what would happen what happened everyone was horrified it's really really sad okay that is the end of this case it's a really 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 sad and horrific horrific case but yeah that is all the information I have to share with you today I hope you enjoyed this video and let me know if there's other true, any other true crime cases you would like me to cover. I'm happy to research into any cases that you think would make an interesting video. So I hope you found this somewhat relaxing. I will see you again really, really, really soon in my